I think you were on the show like a year and a half ago, <laughs> really time. early on in your uh, presidential aspirations. It's come incredibly far. You're going to make the debate. I want to start off with uh, some timely news. A lot of your focus is on automation and tech. Today we get news that DC, it looks like, are getting to ramp up antitrust scrutiny over some of the big tech companies. Do you support this? Would you support, say, breaking up a Facebook, Google, Amazon, and so on? Well, uh, I think, are there excesses in tech and consolidation? Yes. Is our antitrust regime out of date? Yes. But the danger, the temptation is to have 20th century solutions for 21st century problems because if you break up, let's say Amazon or Google into four mini Amazons or four mini Googles, uh, that doesn't magically revive Main Street economies and it may not solve the problems you're trying to solve. So we have to be very, very refined and nuanced and not just succumb to this temptation that if we break them up, it's going to solve the problem. Because tech is unique in that no one wants to use the fourth best navigation app. Mm. It's, not, it's not like competition <laughs> is the win. There's a reason why we Google things, we don't Bing things, if you know what I mean. Talk to me in your book, page 110, I flip it open and you open up on a chapter about Youngstown, Ohio. How do you plan to differentiate yourself in terms of bringing jobs back? How do you differentiate yourself in that aspect in manufacturing against a very crowded democratic field and maybe more importantly against a current president who's really touted this aspect of bringing jobs back to places like Ohio? Well, this is in many ways the core idea of my campaign. Donald Trump is our president today because we automated away 4 million manufacturing jobs in Ohio, Michigan, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and he campaigned saying we're going to bring them back. And I'm saying instead we're going to share the bounty from all these new innovations with the people in Youngstown in the form of a dividend of $1,000 a month. Because if you think we're going to revive manufacturing, the reality is if you go to a car plant, uh, it's a bunch of machines. It's not a bunch of humans. And that's not going to change. It's not going to reverse itself. So we need to own the reality of the 21st century and start distributing the bounty more quickly and broadly. This is your freedom dividend, as it's known, or universal basic income, as some might more commonly know it. It's something that's been deployed to a certain extent in Europe. Nordic style means that VAT pays for it. But A, $1,000 how does that carry weight in perhaps New York vis-a-vis -vis, and California vis-a-vis -vis Ohio and some other states? And, and really, what, what do they do? How are you going to ensure that people are getting retrained as well to ensure that when their automated jobs are go, go away, they can not just live off 1,000 but go to something else? Well, the, the great thing is that $1,000 goes much further in Youngstown than it does here in, yeah. in, in New York. And if you uh, extrapolate what's ha what happens with that money, it gets circulated on and on through their Main Street businesses over and over again. It creates over 2 million new jobs right there in their local neighborhoods and, and uh, economies. And it can keep some of these places, frankly, from boarding up uh, and, and closing. Because right now, 30% of malls and stores are set to close in the next But I thought years. legal jobs were the main ones that are going to go in in terms of uh, automation. How it, It's not just everyone in Ohio, it's not just manufacturing jobs that are going and therefore we're going to be cities that are going to need more, one, more than $1,000. That, that's right. The major employment sectors in this country are retail and sales, administrative and clerical, food service and food prep, transportation and truck driving and manufacturing and they're all contracting very, very fast. It's one reason why Trump's our president today and the retraining myth, and I call it a myth because we're uh, very, very bad at it. The effectiveness rate of federally funded retraining programs is between 0 and 15 percent. So if a politician talks about retraining, they're essentially being irresponsible. They're saying we can do something we cannot do. Uh, I want to clarify something about the $1,000 a month freedom dividend. If someone, is it opt-in, and if so, do people lose other benefits that they might be getting? And what benefits, if so, would they no longer have access to if they take the $1,000 a month check? Yeah, so the Freedom Dividend, it's universal. You'd get it. Uh, Mike Bloomberg would get it if he wants it, though he's probably, uh, you know, too flush to bother. <laughs> uh, but if you opted in, then you'd be foregoing benefits from current cash and cash-like programs. Uh, so that would include housing assistance, fuel subsidies, uh, EBT cards. It does not include Social Security, health care benefits. Uh, so people would be giving up, just to be clear, people would be losing food stamps, things like this, in exchange for... The $1,000. Yeah, but the great thing is um, we leave no one worse off, and people can very easily make their own determination whether $1,000 in unconditional cash is better than whatever they're currently getting. But when I talk to people who are on their existing programs, a lot of them don't love the, the reporting requirements, the fact they can only spend money on certain things. And $1,000 cash is very appealing if they're receiving anywhere close to that amount. Is that the policy that you feel like can really make you stand out? I mean, so often we sit here and we talk about how polarized we are. We've gone so far right and so far left that there's no one in the middle really to bring us together anymore. Is this your tool to get you ahead to start to bring people together? 
Yeah, the, the freedom dividend is very bipartisan. The state that's had a dividend for the last 39 years is a deep red Republican state, Alaska, which funds it with oil. And I'm going around the country saying that technology is the oil of the 21st century. And this policy, it's not left, it's not right, it's forward, and that's where we have to go. I'm going to take it back to potentially the other areas that you're looking at disrupting, because it's not just potentially how we're going to see a new jobs area, but it's got how we have a different healthcare system. I'm fascinated by the presidential campaign in the US because it's deemed in as some US. extra... <laughs> well, well, it's sort of seen as an extreme point of view to think that you have a single-payer healthcare system, whereas, of course, I come from the UK where this is terribly normal and not wildly socialist. But what, from your perspective, do you think this would add, having a single-payer healthcare system, and, and how do you actually bring it to bear? Well, I, I, I worked in the healthcare sector for four years at a technology company, and the big problem is that the incentives are all wrong. The incentives end up rewarding activity and protecting yourself from lawsuits and not things that necessarily increase our, our health or well-being. And so your experience in the UK is really, to me, where the US needs to head, and I agree with you that what seems extreme uh, here is actually completely mainstream in other parts of the world. I want to ask you a question about the success you've had in your campaign. Earlier, I asked on Twitter, I was like, oh, what should we ask Andrew when he comes on? And like half of the responses had something to do with Bitcoin or asking about <laughs> your views on crypto. And I'm curious why you think that your campaign has really resonated with this sort of extremely online demographic of people who care about things like Bitcoin and Internet and makes a lot of memes and stuff like that. Well, I'm addressing the problems that Americans are actually experiencing day to day. Uh, and the problems that, that we're solving, we have to have 21st century solutions. And that's why the folks who are in the cryptocurrency community and folks that, frankly, a lot of my supporters have never contributed to a political campaign right. uh, before this one. And so we're already drawing Trump supporters, independents, libertarians, and conservatives, as well as Democrats and progressives. It's why I'm going to be the best candidate situated to beat Donald Trump in 2020. Though you bring up Donald Trump, and d again, just to play devil's advocate, we talk here all the time around this table about employment. Jobs numbers are good. Consumer sentiment feels good. How do you improve from there? What makes you different? Because so far, maybe his approval numbers don't reflect that, but the data, the fundamental data that we look at every day is good. Well, we're in year 11 of an expansion. <laughs> that expansion may or may not go on forever. Uh, and if you remember Donald Trump, the candidate, in 2015, what was he saying? He was saying these numbers don't reflect what's going on on the, on the ground. This unemployment rate is fake news. And then he got into office, and all of a sudden, all the stats are real. Um, the truth is he was right the first time, where almost one in five prime working age American men hasn't worked in a year, and our labor force participation rate is at 63 percent, the same levels as Ecuador and Costa Rica. Now, you don't hear him talking about that now that he's in the White House, um, but the stats truly have been measuring the wrong things for quite some time. Talk to us about the Democratic Party in general and how, when you come out the other side, maybe you win, maybe you don't and you look at potentially taking a role in the White House other than presidential. I win. Would you you win? <laughs> How do you bring the Democratic Party together? Because you are having an all it's going to divide itself during this campaign. How do you then ensure that it moves on together? What is it, do, is it doing right right now? What is it doing wrong? Well, the Democratic Party is fixated on one fundamental question. How do we beat Donald Trump in 2020? And so after I beat Donald Trump in 2020, Democrats will be so exultant, they will be so <laughs> thrilled uh, that we're going to come together and have a, a ton of unanimity about trying to make big things happen for the American people. And here's the great thing about the freedom dividend, is that conservatives, people in red states on the interior, people in rural areas are going to love the dividend too. We get that done for the American people. And then the U United States, we look up and be like, wow, our government did something right for a change. What else can we get done? Uh, are you ever going to sell the pink hats in your store? Uh, <laughs> you know, we're starting with the math hats. Yeah. Make America think harder. Uh, it's our best seller. Oh, I didn't realize it was an acronym. <laughs> yeah. Like, it has uh, to be if you're going to beat Trump. But, but we're very happy to expand our, uh, you know, our store over time.